So my name is Oleg, I'm actually from Berlin, but not many people know me because I'm not often at the meetups. Um, I would like to ask you some questions before I start, uh, just to, to get the idea of what you're doing in your, in your work. Right? Uh, how many of you are front-end developers? Everyone, all right. <laughs> <laughs> how many of you are actually writing CSS? A lot of you, right? And how many of you use CSS and JS? Quite a few, right? Great. So, hello and welcome back to the future. And to some of us, CSS and JS is about three years old or something. And many think it's still something fancy and you know recently invented. But the reality is different. The reality is that CSS and JS is over 20 years old. It was proposed in 1996. It was even implemented in the browser Netscape back in the days. So today we are kind of back in the future. And imagine you just came back and you look at what we are doing and something has changed. People are not thinking in websites anymore. They are, they are thinking in components. And people are not, uh, I mean, and people are not building, uh, sorry. Uh, so people are not uh, building a website, they are building uh, applications. And they are not building, uh, they are not using websites, they are using components. So uh, I work at a company called Grape, and we we built a chat. For, we built a chat application. It's similar to Slack for big corporates. So for some reason, I think that we are working on an application. And so I was I was trying to explain myself why why I think that it is an application. So I decided to find out what's the difference between applications and websites. And to be honest, I haven't found one good definition. So I kind of wrote my own. And so what I think is uh, web apps have more complex interactions and maintain a state on the client, while websites mostly render static information. So as I built this library called uh, JSS in uh, back in the days, it was uh, 2014. Uh, what I was asked a lot is like, what what is so special about it? Why are you doing it? Like, what can it do? We cannot do the static preprocessing. And you know, most of the time, me and all other people who are trying to to use CSS and JS were were saying it's like we need class names and modules and variables. Etc. But to be honest, it's not a unique value proposition of CSS and JS. It's something you can also do on the server with preprocessing. So today I'm going to talk about three important things which you can only do in CSS and JS in JavaScript. So first one is publishing. Second one is theming. Data-driven styling and a little bit about the future of CSS and JS. Let's talk about publishing. So the only thing that every software engineer agrees on is that software is too complex. And the only way I know of that makes it easier is to rely on work of each other. So for the modern content, I think the best way you can, the best way we have right now is that to use npm registry, and it's great. It has almost six hundred thousand packages, which is a huge, huge amount of packages. But there is one problem with that. Uh, they are not always good. <laughs> there are too many cheap packages, and you know it's so easy to publish something to npm. Uh, the CLI is so easy to use that it basically begs you to, you know, to publish something. <laughs> and so, actually, for JavaScript, we have a bunch of tools to make sure that the quality is not too bad. 
Uh, we have linters, we have typings, we have tests, and I even consider runtime errors uh, to be a quality assurance tool because uh, it doesn't mean you have to break the UI if you have runtime error. It means that you can handle it gracefully and you can log it and you can get a notification that something goes wrong. So what do we have for CSS? This is a screenshot from Bootstrap, the most popular CSS library. And basically what it says is like, copy paste the style sheet into your head before all other style sheets to load our CSS. And that's it, we are done, right? Nice, but there are some issues. Um, namespacing and specificity conflicts are real. You cannot publish something to NPM as of today and then use it and like have no issues with that. It's really hard to have reusable packages on NPM which don't conflict with each other. Don't worry, I've got you covered. I have a new methodology tip for you. It's called package floor element modifier. <laughs> it's like BAM, but you know, with package brackets. But seriously, I don't want to write this. This is ugly and I don't think it's even maintainable. So when I think of CSS and JS, I think of something that provides a constraints operation, which gives us API, which restricts our usage of CSS to something that works for components. There is one another way to do that, and most problem, problems will be gone, and it's called Shadow DOM. For those uh, who don't know what it is, it basically, it's basically a specification which will be at some point probably eventually implemented uh, in the browser, and it allows us to have a real scoping of CSS. And yeah, the, the issue is that it's still not ready, and it's in work for about five years now, it's still not well supported. And there is a doubt that it will be fast because one common question in this is how do you reuse styles which are common to each component? Because with say Tridotum, you cannot have some global CSS which, which can reach into the component it never works. So my answer to this is always back in JavaScript or any other better language that will be eventually in every browser. Because it's not about JavaScript, it's about the power of abstraction. JavaScript can provide us with an abstraction which can fix our issues as of today, right now, and will make sure that we can fix them or work around them in the future as well. My second topic is about theming. So, what is a theme anyways? I, I couldn't find any good explanation, so the very, the, very, the very basic one is theme is a configuration that defines the look and feel of, a, of an application. Let's take an example. This is a material UI library which is implementing uh, React uh, Google's uh, material design. And this one is particularly good and it's the most popular one. So this is how the theme looks like in this library. It's basically an object which defines the colors, shadows, transitions, mixings, spacings, and so on and so on. So let's assume we don't want to use React for this, and we don't use we don't want any libraries at all. Let's try to do theming with just vanilla CSS. So there are some ways to do that. The one is which is most popular, is a built-in theme. So, which means that you have a configuration somewhere, maybe SAS variables or whatever it is, and then uh, you build your CSS, which already contains the entire theming data. So the problem with that is if you have an application where you have multiple themes and you switch the theme, you need to redownload the entire CSS. And, uh, an even bigger issue is that if you have many th teams working on the same product, on the, on the same site, on different pages, and suddenly you want to do a redesign, so you start 
change in your team, you need to go around to every team and ask them to create a build. And once every team is ready to create a build, now you can now you can actually create the production build for the entire application and release it. So you, you in the meantime you will be blocking every team with the with the update. It's really a lot of coordination work. It's kind of human limitation. It's not technical. So there is another way. You can use CSS variables, right? They are basically created for this. And the problem with that is, first of all, a port from uh, MDN. CSS variables are subject to the cascade and inherit their value from the parent, which means that we essentially have the same issues we have the regular CSS, we have uh, class name collisions, and uh, same way we have custom properties collisions. And so we need still a tool which allows uh, to, 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 you know, to make sure that there, there are no namespace collisions by generating the properties. And yeah, the second problem is we can't really use it yet because it's not supported in IA 11 and below. So we have, we have to wait a number of years until we can actually use it in the most popular browsers. So what I think is that React's context behaves a lot like a CSS variable. And I will explain why. Um, let's take an, an example. This is a theme created using Material UI API. We just define some colors. It doesn't matter. And now this is how you use uh, Material UI theme provider in React. You basically have a provider and you have everything inside of it, like the entire application is inside of it. And it's every component which is aware of, of, of the theming is able to access, access it uh, over the context. Which means that this theme I provided on the top is accessible to every component inside. Which also means I can change this theme on top or replace it and everything is rendered at runtime without any cost, without any redoubles, really quick. Another interesting thing is that you can actually nest providers inside of your application. For instance, if you have a sidebar which has a little bit different looking buttons, you can have another theme provider nested within the, other, the first one, and so the, the second button will use the, the theme too from the parent provider. So you can still use exactly the same components, but they will look different in different subtrees. My next topic is about data-driven style. And I know two kinds of data-driven styling. First one is state-based. So state-based is basically styling which directly depends on your application state. And the application state in this case could be anything. It could be user settings, it could be whether it could be your mood or your CEO's mood, whatever. It could be any data. And you want sometimes uh, you know, application behave and look differently depending on very dynamic conditions. The second kind of data driven styling is streaming animations. And what I mean by this is, take a, let's take a look at this, uh, this example. This is a switch uh, from iOS. And many people don't even notice why uh, those controls in, in the mobile world feel so nice. So the reason is actually that animations in, the, uh, in there are not that simple as on the web. When you, when you swipe this button, what happens is uh, the velo velocity of your finger will be calculated and used in the physics engine, which will calculate the acceleration and deceleration of this pattern. Basically applying certain gravity to a certain base of this object, which makes you feel like this object is moving very naturally. And our eye is like, perfectly trained to recognize 
natural and not natural movements. We are really good at this. And suddenly you cannot use uh, transitions or keyframes for this, because in order to do so, you need to know in advance how the movement will look like. You need to predefine the entire animation. In this case, it's just not known. So if you do this in, re in, in the web in the web platform, what you, what you normally use is inline styles. And if we talk about React platform, we would use React inline styles, which is quite and difficult because you have uh, certain issues. Um, if you need this kind of performance, controlling an animation at 60 FPS, you will need maximum of performance you can get. But if you apply styles using components re render, you will have two things to do, or React yeah, will have two things to do. It's reconciliation, which means basically it will call every component or every child component you have and build a diff and see what it needs to apply to the DOM. And the styles application, when you provide styles object um, to, to React, you provide basically a declarative final state on the styles, which means that React has to look over it and see what, what, has, what has been removed and what has changed and apply it, which, and both, both of those things create some overhead. So we need an extreme performance for these kind of animations. We need 60 FPS controlled by JavaScript, each frame in just one thread. And potentially we have other things to do in the browser at that time. So my suggestion is to use CSSOM. CSSOM is CSS object model. Um, not many people know about it, but it actually has an API. So CSS object model is an API in JavaScript to modify CSS. You can create CSS rules in JavaScript. And this is the very basic example of how it could, can look like. You basically create a style element, you put it into the head of the document, and you use insert rule function, which inserts the string. Basically, it's a CSS rule. And that's it. You ju just generate the CSS from JavaScript. And the other thing many don't know is that we can mutate these styles it's the same way we can do this in, in, with inline styles. Um, CSS rules implement this style object with the same interface, and you can actually set the properties to any value dynamically. You can update the CSS rule without any overhead. It's really fast. So those examples were quite low level. If you want to do something like this in your application, you would probably need some higher level interface. And in JSS, we have function values, which is basically a function which returns an actual CSS value. So when you call update and pass the new data, if it's in React, it's props. Um, JSS calls these functions, receives the value, and applies it to CSS error. It's completely outside of React's render cycle. It does it completely independently uh, with very low overhead. And to avoid any React overhead, um, you can just use shoot component update false, and after the first render, React will just do nothing. This is a small demo. Uh, you can probably not see the FPS, but or you can you can actually do it. So we have right now ten objects animating this JSS, and we have right now fifty FPS. For some reason, actually, we should have. 60. Might be something running on my computer right now. I will render some more. Normally, it would go on my computer up to 250 objects without losing any performance. So we are right now at 50 objects. And I'm still at 50. Oh, I know where we have 50 FPS. This uh, projector is using 50 gigahertz. Yeah. So now we go a little bit beyond 50. We are a little bit further now. Yeah. So now I will just switch to React in my styles just to show the difference. By the way, we are now animating 340 objects with JSS. Now we are at React in my styles. So FPS dropped by 
60, 70, or something like that. And right now it's 8, yes, 16, 15, and so it's like normally it's about two to three times slower. Of course, React has to do a lot to, to, to do this. And yeah, so function values are really performant and you can do a lot with them. But if you have real complex animations where you have a lot of data streams you want to synchronize because you have many, many objects to animate, you might want to have some API which allows you to you know, um, manipulate all this data. And so, observables. Uh, there is even a proposal on 30 TC39 uh, about observables. Please go ahead and like take a look at this and start it so we can finally move on with this uh, proposal because this is really great one and it's very minimalistic. You will understand it in five minutes. And so let's take a look at the JSS example, how it uses observables. So yeah, we added observables to JSS9. And now, so this example is basically using a very simplistic observable. Um, I have a color property and I assign a new observable and I immediately return the next value of color red. So it's basically the same like function values, but now it's using observables. In the real world, you would use um, Rx or any other reactive library and pass the observable object into the styles generator function. So it's it's not much to learn here. And all I needed to support observables in JSS was just this. I'm using this is observable package, which is like I don't know 500 bytes or something. It's really small. And if I identify a value which is an observable. I subscribe, and once I receive a new value, I set the value to the JSS rule, and basically I'm done. So to support observables, I needed like five lines of code because the core the core API is very minimalistic. And the beautiful thing about it is that the, this core observable is compatible with every uh, reactive library like read. RxJS, BaconJS, Kefir. So you, you can actually have your entire breakfast. Another thing is uh, it is push based, which feeds well for our purposes if we want to, to use events like mouse move, which are very, very frequent, or data streams, which come from a physics engine, which are also very frequent. So um, it's very efficient, it's lazy, which means it does nothing until events appear. And it's basically a handy API for stream coordination, which you may need if you have something complex to, to coordinate. And uh, the beauty of it is that it works perfectly with CSS object model. Because uh, first of all, they are both decoupled. Observables are decoupled from the data, data source. And CSSOM is decoupled from DOM or for, from rendering, from components. They are both lazy, which means you can create an observable and it does nothing until events start coming in. Same for CSSOM. You can create a CSS rule and it does nothing until you assign the selector or a class name to some DOM node. And then uh, this CSS rule applied to the, to the node and does something actually. So uh, the beauty of it is you can, you can pass this class name to any DOM node or to many DOM nodes at the same time and you can remove it so that uh, it's immediately reusable. Right, let's talk about the future of CSS yes. So I'm working on a project which is trying to fix the, the, the worst issue we have right now with CSS and JS. But in reality, it's not just CSS and JS who, which has this issue. We have this issue as well with uh, SAS and LESS and so on and so on, because if you publish something to NPM, you have to use the compiled CSS. And you cannot modify anymore much because you don't have the variables and sources in the original language. And if you, if you do, if you use the original files like SAS, 
you have to stick with the, with the same language. So it's a limitation. It has been always there, but with CSS and JS, we got it even worse because we got, uh, I don't know, like 50 or something uh, CSS and JS libraries, and every library has its own format. So now we can't really reuse any package from uh, the registry without actually downloading the library itself. And most of the time, we end up having many libraries in our production build, which is not good. So this is a quote from myself. Uh, the biggest issue is here we have. <laughs> uh, we currently have all CSSJS implementation is that they, they are not shareable without their runtime. This is like serious. We, we, we need to solve that. And so I started one uh, effort, which is called interoperable style transfer format. <laughs> Sounds complex, but it is really not. Um, go ahead and look at this uh, URL. It's, it's not that hard, and the idea is actually very simple. So I'm not alone in there. Uh, Glenn Mother from Style Components, who was also co creator of CSS modules, and Tab Atkins, who is actually writing CSS specs at W3C, and he helped a lot as well. And Sultan, who wrote the fastest CSS parser ever written in JavaScript. It's 20 times faster than post-CSS parser. And uh, especially Phil, Phil uh, who is also a core maintainer of Style Components. And um, he's working right now at the prototype for ASTF. He's writing a new parser for CSS, actually. So huge props to him, because he's investing a lot of time to make it work. So, what is ISTF? Interoperable, which means you can publish with any CSS and JS library and hopefully at some point also with SAS and LES and whatever else, and consume it with any other library, which means basically if you publish to NPM a button written using style components, then you can install it and render it at runtime using just one library, for instance, JSS or any other. It's compatible with all CSS features, and it's also compatible with all CSS and JS features. And I consider CSS and JS to be a superset of CSS, because we have more than just CSS. We have function values, we have observables, we have uh, many different other cases you cannot just do with static CSS. It is optimized for transfer, which means the, the format itself it's quite compact. It is easy to be downloaded from, from NPM, it's small, and it's also fine to be used at runtime. You can bundle it and don't worry about the size. And the final thing, which, which is quite important, that it's designed for parsers. It's not for humans, which means if you look at it, it might look like a bytecode or something. So it's not something you need to read. It's for parsers. And the format is optimized to be really, really fast. It has almost zero overhead when you parse the runtime with JavaScript. And this is basically how it looks like. Uh, on top, you see a regular CSS. And on the bottom, it's JSS, uh, ISDF, sorry. So what you see here is constants, which will be, they are here just to be readable. Uh, at the end, it's just some number which identifies the marker of the rule start or selector or property. And so you basically have just one array of things which identify every CSS uh, you know, language feature. So everything, uh, the, the only thing uh, parsers need to do at the end is just have one loop for this array and build whatever they need. You can produce an AST out of it, you can build a final CSS out of it, you can do this at runtime, it's really fast. So at the end of the day, all we want with all these CSS and JS is building more robust applications faster. And uh, I have a coding challenge. 
Uh, this is a, a cat, uh, it's called Swinging Cat, uh, originally created by David Korshit. Um, and this cat is beautiful, it looks so nice and moves so smoothly. And right now, this is a port uh, of the original one um, using JSS. You can find it on GitHub uh, using this URL. And so the original one is using uh, keyframe animations. So the entire animation is predefined. Now, so the coding challenge is learn how to control the cat. Uh, you can use observables and RxJS or any other native library and replace uh, regular static animations with observable ones and see how it works. Uh, if you create something cool, uh, just tweet and I will retweet and I will add it to the documentation. Thanks. Thanks for